Welcome. Thanks for joining our Drive Electric Week virtual sessions, uh, DIY perspectives on EV conversions. I'm Aaron Choate, the president of Austin EV, the local chapter of the Electric Vehicle Association. Um, and Kevin Carafa will be giving our presentation today. And then I will be opening the floor to questions. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will um, share them or invite you to unmute so you can ask them yourselves. Okay, Kevin, please go ahead. Well, hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining the session today. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, do-it-yourself electric vehicle conversion. And um, I actually am a uh, owner in a shop here called Austin EV Only, it's a banner here on my shirt. And our business is primarily repairing Teslas. Um, some of the basic things that the service center can't get to, but along the way, we realized that a lot of folks have reached out to us and asked us if we could help them convert their electric vehicles. And it's actually become by and large, the largest piece of our portfolio is doing electric vehicle conversions. Um, so I'm gonna share a story with you here about one of the ones we've done. And we are so new to the process that I think even from a DIY perspective, there's a lot to be gained you know, we're, um, we, we are, you know, quote unquote professionals, but every time is different. Every time is new. And the lessons are so fresh in our minds that I wanted to share them with you um, because I think they're relevant for anyone who's looking to undertake that process. Um, because of this format where we're virtual today, I would love it if you guys could come in the shop and tour um, the vehicle that we're working on today. Um, but I understand that uh, due to the limitations, it's not possible. So what I did instead was I set up a slideshow and please forgive me. Um, you know, I was thinking that rather than take my computer with its not so great internal camera and walking around the shop that I would instead just show you all some, some candid shots where I could get in really close, you know, with a decent sized camera and, and go through that with you. So, uh, you know, I hate to make this like, you know, I remember my grandma used to do slideshow and, of her vacation trip photos and would bore me to death. So I, I hope that's not this. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat. I told Aaron explicitly to interrupt, you know, so that we could answer those questions live. So, you know, again, don't feel shy about typing your questions there. Um, so again, my name is, here's my contact info, Kevin Carafa. We're, our company is called Austin EV Only. Uh, and you can reach me at owner at austineveonly.com. And real quick, I'll jump here to the website, just to show you kind of quick look around and then tell you a little bit more about what we do here. So hopefully everyone can see this. I just went real quick and just noted, you know, in the R services, Tesla repair is, you know, what we started out doing. And it seems like full EV conversion is what we spend the most time doing. And uh, if anyone is interested, I'll just shamelessly plug this here. These are some of the Tesla services that we, we typically see and we typically hear about. So uh, with that, back to the presentation here. Um, so we're relatively new, founded in November, 2020. A team of a small team of three, myself, Kevin Carafa, I have a background as an electrical engineer. Uh, my fabrication specialist or machinist, Carlos Hernandez, and then a marketing and strategy specialist, Gurkaran. Um, and together, again, we're trying to attack the EV market. Uh, I feel like, especially here in Austin, there's a big need for a lot of these services and limited options out there. Um, and the shameless plug, we are actually looking to expand our team. So if you know of anyone or you yourself have an interest, we're looking for welders or um, CAD specialists to help us along our journey. So just keep that in mind. So let's talk about the project and what we're working on here. I don't know how many folks have heard of this company here in town, Literati. They are a book subscription service and they focus mostly on children's books. Um, they reached out to me through the website and asked if I could convert their Bookmobile, they call it Bookmoto. And um, it seems like such a great project and such a great partnership that I, I absolutely you know, agreed and jumped in full-fledged uh, to take this on. So this, I want you to kind of memorialize this picture in your mind. This is what it looked like you know, on day one when it showed up to me. Uh, and I'll take you through you know, how much it's changed over the last couple of months here. Um, so let me take a pause here. You know, you're here to learn about EV conversion. So let's talk about the steps necessary to do a conversion. Uh, it's, it's not a small undertaking by any means. Uh, I don't know if I can't see if Fred's out there, but he definitely warned me before undertaking this, um, having been in the community for a while. And uh, let's see, yeah, I see him on. So, and said, hey, this is, 
this is not a small undertaking. So you really need to plan and, and doubly that. So I did quite a bit of research and planning. The first on the research piece, um, sorry, let me go through the steps. Research, then the planning piece, which is actually like, okay, let's, let's figure out you know, what parts we want, where are the parts gonna go, how is that all gonna work? If there's anything that you can't figure out on your own, you're gonna have to outsource that. Uh, so this is a make or buy decision. And so in, in a lot of cases, I realized that I alone don't have the technical specialty in all the areas necessary. You know, there's electrical, there's mechanical, um, there's software programming, there's CAD, you know, there's all these different pieces that need to come together. And, and it's, I'm not saying that no one person can do it, but I'm just saying it goes a lot faster if you have experts in each, in each uh, area. And with Literati, they specifically asked if we could go quickly, you know, as quickly as possible. <laughs> they stressed that multiple times throughout the project. And so anywhere where we could reduce the the total life cycle of the conversion, I looked for areas where I could buy expertise and, as opposed to acquiring it myself. Um, and then uh, ordered the parts. We're right now in the assembly phase. Um, so unfortunately I can't show you a finished product today uh, and we're only working on the one right now, but I did want to show you kind of where we're at and how that's going. And then uh, of course, once we finish the assembly, we'll get into testing phase. And so we're not there yet. And I don't have much to say on that today, but it uh, should be fun. So let's jump to the next slide here. So, so research. So, you know, I read the following two books and in retrospect, you know, looking back, it probably didn't even begin to scratch the surface of things I needed to think about it. These, these two books that I picked up and I, you know, I read cover to cover and I was like, Hey, I can do this. This shouldn't be too hard. Uh, it's focused on the electrical. And as I mentioned, I'm an electrical engineer. And so this, this seemed very familiar to me. Um, and, and going through it, I didn't, consider some of the other pieces, but you know, we're here now and we're almost done. Um, so at the end of this, you know, being an electrical engineer, I put together an electrical block diagram. Um, this actually is not that complex. I'll just break it down real quick. Over here on the left is a battery pack. You know, the battery pack thing is a number of things. First and foremost, a battery charger and a DC DC converter. Um, and then if we just skip over here through a main contactor, which drops down to the controller, which then drops down to the motor. So at a very high level, I'm like, hey, there's only like six blocks or seven blocks that you need to really focus on. And everything else is more like this is all here is safety. This big yellow, I'm sorry, blue, green box here is instrumentation. So just think of those as, you know, black boxes, you know, input in, input out. And don't worry about what's in the middle. So I'm like, okay, there's only really six things I need to worry about. You know, battery, motor, motor controller, um, battery controller, uh, DC, DC converter, and, and a couple other things. Uh, like potentiometer, some other stuff. So, so I'm like, great, I got this together. I'm ready. Let's do this. Um, so the first thing I did was, hey, we've got to kind of break this thing down. So I had the shell of the book mobile removed, the bookcase, if you will. I had that piece removed so that I could really get at the uh, the internals, and very quickly realized, hey, I'm not a. I, I definitely know my way around auto repair. I'm not, I'm not uh, new to that. I've been doing that for, gosh, 15, 20 years now. I've been doing auto repair. So I definitely know my way around. But at the same time, welding, fabrication, that is not my specialty. So the very next thing I did was seek out a specialist in fabrication. Um, the first person I went to that the Fred recommended was like, hey, do you have any CAD drawings or do you have specifics? And I said, no, I have no idea what I'm doing. And they were like, get lost. So that didn't work out. And then I went to another, um, machinists. They had their own on-site CAD capabilities and they saw the book Moto and they saw how cool it looked. And they're like, we would love to take on this project. We will be happy to do that. So, uh, so I, I partnered with them before bringing it to them. I removed the motor actually it was very easy. It probably only took me five hours. I had it done like the first night I got it. I took the motor off, you know, just with reckless abandon, undid every single bolt I could find until the thing like just basically fell off. So then I was left with this which is, you know, a motorless differential and axle. And looking at this, I quickly realized, how am I going to attach an electric motor to this? Like, what am I even looking at here? I'm out of my element. I need help. So that's when I came to uh, the folks here at Astro Mechanics. Um, let me just make sure I did this last time. I want to share the audio before I hit play here. There it is. Okay. And then, where did my presentation go? We've moved it. 
We've moved into the. There, there we go. Are. Okay, so I'm gonna hit play here. So I know this Can is anticlimactic, but uh, I got busy dealing with the guys and I forgot to record the uh, conversation we had. But basically, just kind of talking about what we want to do. One of the things they suggested was to remove this deck here, uh, make things easier for them, and I agree 100% that that would be easy, you know, easier for everybody. Um, so I'm hoping that we can all work it out, but I'm looking forward to seeing how this turns out uh, mechanically, you know, electrically, that's where I come in and I'll take care of that. But the, the mechanical piece, that's what Astro Mechanics are all about. Awesome, sorry if the audio was echoing there. Um, so, so yeah, so in summary, right. found a, a machine shop that, that did the mechanical piece. Um, and so now we're in the world of machining and mechanics, and this is just not my realm, but I wanted to share this with everyone so that they know, like, it's not just the electrification piece, right? There's a whole lot more that gets into, into uh, EV conversion. And, you know, a typical EV conversion will involve attaching an electric motor to the existing, probably transmission, if you will, especially, I, I think it's, it's uh, manual transmission is probably the most common one. And you get the the bell housing of that transmission and you match it up with your motor and you put it together and boom, you're done. Uh, you know, you need a special plate and a coupler and, and welding points and you're done. But this was much more than that because I couldn't figure out how to easily attach. So I ordered a whole new transaxle and this, uh, the customer literati wanted this done immediately as fast as possible. And while the perfect transaxle existed in China, Everyone's aware of the global supply shortage, you know, the, the supply chain issues. So it seems sensible to order a used transaxle. And I found this one on eBay and it looked great. Um, and it's made for golf carts. I think this one came out of a Chrysler or Polaris gem car. So I'm like, this is great. This is perfect. This is what I need. And so I ordered it. Three weeks later, it showed up and we're like, okay, now what do we do? So we've got a lot of guys at the machine shop standing around you know, looking at the, at this thing, trying to scratching their heads and trying to figure out what to do. Um, I'll point out there's three gentlemen here starting from the left. This is Carlos. He is my uh, machinist, the in-house machinist. And then these other two gentlemen work for Astro Mechanics. Joseph, he's the actual welder. And then Butch, he just stands around and tells people what to do. Um, so, so now they're trying to figure out what to do and they've removed the deck and we've put in the, we put in a, uh, a framework, if you will, to hold the old deck and we're like, okay, wait, how do we attach say these, uh, these shocks here and the strut towers? And they said, you know what, we've got to start over. So even though they're a professional fabrication shop, they didn't even consider how to attach everything. So they had to tear this whole thing apart and start over again. Um, so here we go. So now they started over again and we've got what is, what will end up being the finished product here. Um, and so what you're looking at is completely manufactured. Um, I wanted it done out of aluminum and they said, listen, kid, there's a supply chain shortage of aluminum. Best to just go with iron. I'm like, fine, we, we're in a time crunch. Go do it. Of course, you know, if I had it to do it over again, maybe I'd say, hey, let's whatever the cost, because this thing is heavy now, so heavy with all the iron. But the little box here is where the battery will be stored and a number of electronics. And then this platform is twofold, one to hold the new Transaxle and two to support the bookcase that came off on that forklift that I showed you all earlier. So real quick, we got it in. There's the new and the old side by side. Um, and this is great. You can see that the new transaxle is beefier and can hold um, the torque of the motor, which are very, you know, they're very high torque motors. So we want to make sure that it's up to the challenge and just the old transaxle was not that. It was probably 40 years old. This, um, I forgot to mention, this, this vehicle, this book Moto, it's a Vespa that's imported from Italy called a Piaggio 850, not manufactured in the U.S., really hard to come by replacement parts because it's not, in the, it's not a U.S. standard. Um, and so just tr transitioning over to this Polaris brand with all U.S. parts just made a lot of sense. Um, so any questions in the chat, Aaron? I'm going to keep going if not. Not yet. All right. Cool. No problem. So I'll keep going. So, so guess what? When you buy something on eBay, it may not be in the best of shape. And so we quickly noticed some problems here. One, the, uh, the manufacturer cut the brake lines. The, I'm sorry, the fabricator, Astro Mechanic, cut the brake lines. And they didn't, you know, they're like, hey, that's, we fabricate things. We're not auto mechanics. We're fabricators. So you figure that out. So then I, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm fairly handy when it comes to automobiles. And, you know, so I had to figure out 
how to get new brake lines in the new in the new transaxle, how to repair a torn CV boot, fine. But it just added to the timeline and the whole time, you know, my customer literati is like, hey, what's the holdup? What is taking so long? And so, you know, when I was planning on this whole thing taking, say, maybe two months from beginning to end, and now we're at, what, four months, five months, and we're still, you know, <laughs> definitely deep into it. Um, so going back to that life cycle, you know, I talked about, hey, after we've done our planning, after we've done our research, um, we, we need to start ordering parts. And so the way I went about it was I just went to some well-known websites of electric vehicle parts. The first one I started with was called EV West. I feel like they're probably the most well-known and looked at all of the parts they offer, just clicked on every single category. And then from there, looked at some, started looking at some competitors. And I think, you know, if you go to Google, they typically show you ads from competitors. So um, I went to Thunderstruck Motors, a couple others, and it's, it, I ended up buying a kit from Thunderstruck Motors, which included the motor, the motor controller, um, the contactor, uh, the, th the, the, uh, not th the potentiometer, all in one kit. And then they sold pretty much all the accessories to go with it. So I used them as a reseller of the batteries. Uh, they resold the battery management and charge management systems called BMS and EVCC. Um, and then that just left for me really to figure out the, the wiring and safety on my own. And then the other piece to figure out would be the, the motor adapter plate, which again, mates the motor to the differential housing, as well as a motor coupler, which mates the spinning part of the motor to the spinning part of the differential. So those two pieces needed to be machined, enter my machinist. Um, so, so I got to it. I started ordering parts. Here we go. I ordered 16 batteries and a battery controller system and a charging system and a charging control system and a motor and a motor co controller and a DC-DC converter and a instrumentation and, a, of course, a plug to plug this whole thing in and a potentiometer safety and contactors and a whole bunch more little parts that could never fit on this screen. I'm out of space. So let's stop there. But, you know, just went through, ordered it all without, you know, considering the finer details and just said, look, once this stuff shows up, I will figure it out. I'll just put it all together. I think I'm a smart guy, electrical engineer. I'll figure it out. So maybe, maybe, or maybe not the best plan, but there it is. So, so I wanted to stop here and just talk real quickly about the motor. Cause this is kind of where we're at. So more problems ensued. The motor shows up. Apparently this thing had been sold and returned before and then sold to me as new. And uh, it is a new motor, except for one small detail, which is someone on the right side cut the coupler, which again, mates the spinning part of the motor to the spinning part of the differential. And so this coupler is no good. I can't figure out how to get it off. You know, I have probably the smartest machinists in town and, and fabricators look at it. They can't figure out how to get it off. And so we agree hey, let's send this thing back to who I bought it from and have them send me uh, a never before sold motor that's as it should be. And that's on the next slide. So this is what it sh should look like, not silver, but black on the coupler. And the motor kit that I bought from them includes all of these parts. And the best part is everything was pre-programmed. So again, you know, if you're not a software engineer, that's okay. They have kits out there that are pre-programmed. Um, where the motor controller is programmed for the motor or the battery management system. You just tell them your configuration and they program that for you. Um, not being shy about that, I actually went ahead and, and dug into some of the programming and I'll show that in two or three more slides here. But I wanted to pause real quick and show, hey, this is the adapter. So you can see like two slides back, there's the motor on the left side with no adapter plate and then here, in the picture, and I don't know if you guys can see me on the video, but here's you know what the adapter plate looks like, which is almost done. It actually needs to have a couple more holes drilled in it. But you know, just that adapter plate alone, I think, cost me like a thousand bucks, you know, for the for the machinist to make, because it has to be machined to such a fine specification uh, that that's you know how it goes. So so then getting into the this will probably be my last slide here. Getting into the programming on the left side is a picture of the battery pack that I assembled all of those wires go to the battery management system. And then on the right, you can see I, uh, through the software in the battery management system, you're able to connect and monitor the battery voltage. And this battery management system helps to regulate the charging and discharging of those batteries so that they're safe. 
These are lithium ion phosphate batteries. And with lithium ions versus other types of batteries, it's very critical that those batteries are kept in a healthy state at all times. And while, you know, your normal 12 volt battery, say in your car, can be charged and discharged within a certain region without a lot of regulation, these batteries are a lot more sensitive and it's imperative that they stay balanced. And so that's what the battery management system does is it maintains balance and the health of those. Um, so I'm going to actually stop there because this is pretty much as far as we got. You know, I'm happy to kind of take folks on a tour of the shop with my not so great laptop camera. But, you know, this is where we're at. So I thought I'd pause here and we would spend, you know, the next, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. So I thought we would open it up for some questions. Sounds great. Um, so the, let's see, the, the one question that we've had so far is, uh, this is your first EV conversion, right? Um, so we worked on a, no, great question. So we worked on an EV conversion for an old Bronco. And that one was, was a lot more simple um, just because there wasn't the challenge of all the mechanics involved. So great okay. question. Have you ever, um, I'm kind of curious, have you, what other ones have you cons considered? Um, so the, let me remember the other guy that reached out. So the, the only other one that reached out, someone has, uh, I can't remember if it was a Prius or a Toyota RAV4 hybrid, but he, he found this, this conversion system that's sold like out of the box that will convert an, a hybrid into a fully electric. And, uh, you know, I told him I'm busy with this project now, but when we finish, I'd love to take it on. So that's probably the next one coming up is this uh, conversion, this kit, which will convert the hybrid to fully electric. Okay. Um, the, let's see, is it, or is regen built into the controller? Great question. So, um, so a lot of folks ask, like, should I do an AC or should I do a DC? One of the advantages of doing an AC motor is the ability to do regenerative braking, right? And just so we're clear, because I know when I first bought my Tesla, I didn't know how it worked. You know, I thought regenerative braking had something to do with the brake pads and recapturing heat energy. It's not. It's basically using the motor in reverse. So instead of providing energy to the motor to make it spin, the existing momentum of the car and causing that motor to spin can be recaptured through the motor. And then in the controller, the motor controller pack that I brought, bought, that is, capa that is a capability um, of that system to recapture that energy and send it back to the batteries. Great question. Okay, Anna has a question. Let me ask her to unmute. Okay, um, the last slide that you were showing, you were mm -hmm. looks like you were connected to the BMS somehow, and you're issuing commands. What is what is that um, talking to? Is is the BMS has some built-in OS that sure. sure. Let me try to do the best to describe it I can. So the Dilithium Designs, I hope I'm saying that right, is the manufacturer of the BMS I have, um, and they have the ability through um, through the US uh, USB cable which connects to the BMS, and then the BMS has a couple of different ways it can connect um, to other. It can connect to other components like the EMCC through an SPI, which is, if I remember correctly, a two-wire connection. Um, and then it can, I assume you're asking about the connection to the computer itself. So it has two, this one in particular has two microchips on board, one for each bank of batteries. And those microchips can take, take in the signal, which I communicate serially through the USB to the BMS. Did that answer your question, Anna? Cool, she's on mute. Great, thank you so much. Awesome, so yeah, I have a lot more I could say as well. If, if there's no other questions, we can kind of go through and talk a little bit about each of the components, if that's preferred, or if there's more questions, I can't see. Yeah, go ahead and show. Um, I'm kind of curious about the contactor choices that you made. Would you, would you man, mind sharing some of the safety concerns related to the fusing and the contactors? Sure. So. So yeah, let's take a step back from that and just say like, how do we size this thing, right? How do we even start figuring that out? And so um, those who drive an electric vehicle may be familiar with, you know, the watt hours per mile, or sometimes it's inverted. 
And it's, uh, but either way, you know, I need to figure out how far do I want this thing to go? How fast do I want it to go? And what does that mean in terms of voltage, in terms of amperage, um, in terms of cable sizing, uh, you know, all of those considerations, how heavy is the vehicle? How big does the motor need to be to power a vehicle of that size? So, so let me kind of run through that process. Um, so, you know, took out a pen and paper and just kind of started to back of the napkin, do some calculations there. And uh, I figure that when this bookmobile is completed with everything that I've added and all the books that it's going to weigh, let's say a thousand pounds. So that's, you know, on the, the lightest side of any car I know, or on the heaviest side of any golf cart I know. So I was trying to find something in that range that was like, a good motor for a golf cart or, or a very small car. Um, and then we're looking at the AC nine. Um, is that by NetGen? I can't remember. And then also looking at the, um, the one that I did get to, uh, through, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, Mont Energy. They have a bunch of ME series motors and kind of went through with, with the help of the folks at uh, Thunderstruck Motors, they helped me kind of select a motor that I thought was the right, you know, the right horsepower, the right torque, the right amperage. So this, this particular motor is a 450 amp peak, which is just the peak, which you probably rarely if never hit, um, and around 200 RMS amperage. So, okay, so then based on that, you know, what is the size of the controller? What is the size of the, the, the cabling? I may have mentioned this before, but Thunderstruck Motor sells a kit, which kind of takes all that into account. So the kit, the motor is pre-wired with, um, is it pronounced the two zero or double zero gauge wire? So I'm like, okay, that's, you know, I'll need at least, you know, I'll need wire that's that thick or thinner. Um, and now I know my amperage considerations. And then I, I settled on a 48 volt battery pack um, for the distance that I was looking for, which I promised the customer it would go something like we said, like, Hey, it'll go between, we'll say 10 miles. Let's say, you know, that's it. It's not a big range we're looking for. So I don't need a huge battery pack. Let's keep the range down. They're saying, look, we're just going to drive it around downtown for, you know, half an hour and we're done. So I'm like, great. Then that's, you know, we don't need that much battery consideration. Um, so yeah, so based on that, you, you know, your question was about the contactor. So if we know, that 200 amps is the RMS and 450 is the peak, then I, you know, I need a, a contactor that will accommodate that. In the kit that I bought, it actually had the contactor already chosen for me. So that was like one less consideration. So I wish there was a better story about like how I carefully, you know, calculated and considered the size of the contactor. But to your question, Aaron, you know, the contactor came with this, this motor kit, which was all sized and the controller, the motor controller was pre-programmed for that motor and that, and I told them, you know, the specs of my application, like this is the weight of the vehicle. This is the speed I want to go. This is, you know, the acceleration. And this, so they took care of that programming for me. So it was a great deal. I think, you know, I, instead of buying the individual components as you know, it, when we, when we do more custom, then I can, I'll do all the programming myself and do that myself. But for this project, it was selected for me. Great question. Bruce, about Any, uh, the the DC to DC choice, where is it uh, a standard DC to DC from some other application or is it not an automotive unit? Um, so it's an automotive unit. And again, just kind of going to the website at Thunderstruck Motors and looking at everything they offered. And in my mind, you know, having read the, the two books on conversion, I'm like, okay, I know I, I made a four page summary out of those two books, like two full, you know, let's say 200 page, about a 400 pages. I reduced it down to four pages of notes. And I was like, okay, this is what I want for a motor. This is what I want for a controller. This is what I want for a contactor. This is what I want, you know, for every last thing I could think of, I wrote down like what I wanted. And so I went to Thunderstruck Motors. I looked under their DC DC converters. I'm like, look, you know, everyone uses 12 volts as their standard for charging their phones. We're going to want one of those to, to power up, you know, your standard kind of uh, peripherals, lights, uh, turn signals, et cetera. So, so that's why I went with the 48 volt pack that I have converted down to uh, the 12 volt that we need to run the accessories. Great question. Are you going to have a 12 volt battery in line or is it, is it going to power entirely off of the DC to DC? Well, we will have a 12 volt in line, one for some protection and two for uh, some uh, kind of regulation in case there's any spikes or anything like that. Just want to make sure that there's no problems there. 
when not. Good question. Could you share a little bit about maybe, um, I know you've talked about reaching out to a variety of people to talk with them about doing this. Is it, can you share a little bit more about um, the community that you've been relying on to, to dig through sure. this topic? So, so fair enough, and, and hopefully Michelle can relate to this, that w that last event we had in town, and maybe you could help remind me where Aaron, I met you, and I met Fred, and then Michelle was there, um, and it was during COVID, but, but just being able to connect with you folks was, was definitely helpful. Um, you know, whether he realizes it or not, Fred has been a great resource for me. Um, the other person is Mark. There you go. Mark um, over at Moment Motors. And we would, I, I, I came to Mark and I said, Mark, I'm not trying to steal your business. I just want to learn about what you do. And Mark actually said, Kevin. I would love it if you would steal some business from me. We have way too much to do. We're not able to get to everything. We're having to turn customers away. There's more than enough room in Austin for more than one EV conversion shop. And, uh, and I shared with him, you know, hey, we're, you know, we're a little scrappy startup, kind of, you know, running out of our garage here. And he was like, uh, or rental, like we're renting a garage by the hour. And he's like, I started the exact same way as you did, Kevin. Don't worry about it. I, you know, rented garage space by the hour at an auto mechanic shop. You know, we shared the space. And, and that's what I'm doing now is, you know, we're in a shared space um, called DIY Austin. So those, those folks at DIY have the additional mechanical knowledge about fixing vehicles. Um, and then Mark has been a great resource as far as helping me source product. Uh, Mark at Moment Motors pointed me at quite a few different people and different um, vendors that resell this stuff and has been a great help. And then the last one I'll mention as far as helping is that, you know, of course, I joined the Facebook groups and online communities where people talk about this and people are doing this and have experience. And so if ever I have a question, in fact, just yesterday, I, I was asking like, hey, uh, between the, the battery and the controller, do I really need double zero gauge, two dash zero gauge? Can I go with something less? And so, you know, all of the, everyone's got an opinion and all the people threw in the chat, you know, their opinion and was able to kind of help, help me guide, guide me as far as what size gauge wire should I use? and, and contactor, et cetera. You know, it's been really helpful to have a community of folks that do this from around the world. I mean, this is not just US-based folks um, in the Facebook groups that I'm a member of. One called DIY uh, Conversions, and I'm trying to remember the other one, uh, is probably just EV Conversions is a group I found. So again, good question. Um, Teresa is asking, so uh, Cost-wise, which is maybe cheaper, buying a used wrecked EV and harvesting the parts from it, or buying like a thunderstruck kit. Great question. So, um, so different people have different opinions on this, and I'm I'm going to start by saying, a lot of people come to me and they're like, "Hey, I want to do, I want to convert my my Honda Civic, my 1992 Honda Civic," and I'm and by and far, it will be much much much, much cheaper to go buy a 2013 Tesla than it will be to convert your Honda Civic, like by, by orders of magnitude cheaper, because I'm going to use, I'm not going to use used parts. I'm going to use new parts because I want it done right. And, you know, the time, the labor, outsourcing, the machining, outsourcing, any fabrication, you know, those people, they charge, let's say $125 an hour, and it's going to take them, gosh, 20 hours or something. So you do the math on, on that. Um, so, so let me start there. So then you're like, okay, let's say I'm going to do all the work myself, save on the labor costs. Should I source the parts new or should I source the parts used? If it's you and you're doing it for yourself, I would source the parts used, right? I mean, finding the parts, whether it's, you know, like on eBay or, you know, through the EV community or, or even going out and buying a wrecked Tesla and scavenging all the parts out of it is going to be much cheaper than the route I'm going, which is like, hey, I want to stand behind my work. I'm only going to use new parts, you know, or guaranteed Tesla modules that that I know have been tested and are guaranteed to work. Um, and a Tesla module typically runs 1,500 per module. And then uh, a typical Tesla has 16. So it just depends. How far do you want your vehicle to go? Do you want it to go as far as a Tesla, buy all 16? Or do you want it to um, can you get by with less, like 100 miles, and then I can just buy like four or five modules and put those together? So great question. Yeah. So the short answer is, you know, and I think for those who have seen Rich Rebuilds, like the answer is, you know, buy a wrecked EV, whether it's a Nissan Leaf or Tesla or whatever, 
harvest the parts and then do it yourself. That's the absolute cheapest way. And of course you can resell anything that you don't use or anything that you pull out of your old vehicle. You can resell those and try to recoup some costs. So Anna was um, was asking or mentioning that the 12 volt battery would probably be need, needed in order to just even start the car to throw the initial power contactor. So, is that so? True? So you're not wrong. Um, the other the other way I was going to power it or I can power it is it just so happens that my controller takes in the 48 volts and one of the pins out of the controller happens to it's got a 12 volt out it's got a 5 volt out so I can tap into the control the motor controller to um power it that way um and i think the reason that you know kind of makes makes more sense for me is uh that the now that i'm actually thinking about it, so the 12 volt battery will will always be there as an always on and so when i flip the switch that's that will be helpful um but if not right the the switch will activate the controller and then it's kind of a, a circular argument like which one gets power first the 48 volts will should always be there so that should always be there, but but I think Anna, it's a good point. Like it might be safer to have that running directly off the 12 volt battery. Did you cool. want to show us something? Yeah. So let's let's do a quick little tour. So I'll just start. I'm actually using the bookshelf as a. So I'll just flip it around here. I, I realize that my camera on the laptop is not that great but there's the there's the book moto in progress um and then more or less i thought i'd just say like hey here's the typical workstation oh, of course my laptop turned off there it is so so while we're seeing here on the uh let's see if i can angle this just right so this is the battery pack i have here um all of these wires here hook into the bms and then i'm actually using a power a, uh, let's see if I can angle this right. There we go. I'm using a power supply for the time being to power the BMS. And then that's plugging in here to my laptop, which is again, communicating through the, through putty and through the USB serial port to the, uh, the BMS there. So I thought that was, I just kind of set that up for you guys to kind of show you um, what's happening here. And then I, I laid out some of uh, the smaller parts that are easier to move. Like this will be the, the DC DC, Converter. Here's the contactor right here, um, and then I think all the other parts are strewn around the shop. So it's just yeah. And then what's the last piece I have right here? I think I may have already shown this, but here's the uh, here's the adapter plate that I've got hanging out here that we're ready. I may have mentioned before we had to ship the motor back due to a uh, bad coupler, and so I wish I had the motor here today, but it's currently being swapped out and sent back. And as soon as I get it, you know, I'm ready to. I'm pretty much ready to put it on and finish everything up. So I feel like we're not far off and I'm going to pick on Fred again. He said that when he got his manufacturing done, it only took him three weeks. So I'm like, great, that's, let me plan on, you know, I'll get everything lined up. I'll get everything programmed, get everything sorted. And then three weeks is what my plan. Hey, um, just a quick follow up regarding the travel battery. Um, I suppose if you do have a turbo battery, you have to worry about keeping it charged somehow as well, which would make things more complicated. So, uh, so yeah, running off the, my plan was then to run off the DC DC converter and that yeah. would be the charge to the 12 volt. And then from the 12 volt power, the lights and, oh, right, and right. the turn signal, yeah. but not. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got that part, I'm just, saying that, that if you had opted to add a 12 volt battery, you, you probably need to mm -hmm. have some uh, intelligence in there to charge it periodically. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I, I see what you're saying that there, yeah, it needs to be a way to monitor that level um, of the voltage, so, and not overcharge it. So yeah, probably, you know, normal cars have a battery regulator. And I, so I, I figured I could tap into that right now. This, this book moto, you know, it had a 12 volt battery before and it had a regulator built in. So I was going to tap into that piece that's already like on board. And the, the DC to DC may actually have like charge algorithms built into it to avoid overcharging a, like a standard lead acid um, battery. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of your challenges will be when the car sits 
still for a long time. Not, not only will it potentially run down your your traction pack, but it may mm -hmm. slowly, depending on whether or not you choose to constantly charge the 12 volt, you may end up also um, potentially not charging it. It depends on what you choose to do. Right, no, it's a great point. As far as, I think folks who drive EVs kind of, kind of know if you let your EV sit in an airport, the traction back pack gets consumed, keeping a trickle charge going on the battery and other components that are running in your EV. So yeah, similar concerns here. And a great point. Thank you for bringing that up, Aaron. So what well, was the charge plan, point? I think. We'll go oh, I'm sorry. What was the charge no, point I was just that saying, you've, you're putting in it? Was that a J1772? So, so while I did show a J1772, because everyone is familiar with that, I asked the customer uh, up front, I said, look, do you want it to charge 220 or 110? What do you, what do you want? And surprisingly, they said that they, they, and let me see if I can find it here. They said they, they, they can just charge it with a 110. And I, look, I don't, uh, I don't make decisions, right? I just, I just execute what I'm told to do. So they told me just make it a 110. So that's what, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so that's, yeah, what we got there is uh, a, uh, what's it called? Weatherized with a cover with a nice seal on them. And, you know, we've got a little spot machined out here where this is going to go. So the, the fabricator took care of all that. Like I, I gave them all the parts and we figured out exactly where we wanted all the parts to go. Um, again, I'm not a CAD specialist, so I just kind of pointed and was like, you know, I brought the actual parts in. They were like, they, even though I had schematics, they said, look, that's great, but we want the actual part here. We want the, we want to touch it. We want to take our own measurements. We appreciate the schematics, but we don't trust it. So I had to bring everything in to the fabricator. We had to kind of put them in place, match them up. And then, um, and then they built kind of to that. But again, you know, I, if I had more expertise and I knew how to CAD myself, then I could have done that and brought those drawings in and said, hey, just build it like this. And it would have saved me a ton of money. Um, and I don't, even, I, I don't even want to tell you guys how much I spent on the fabrication piece. But it was, it was a lot just because I didn't know what I was doing and just kind of said, hey, guys, here's, here's what I want. Let me describe it to you verbally. Let me show you with the part. And then you guys figure it out. And so they were, they were happy to do that. And, uh, and a fool was parted from his money. So, <laughs> so. But yeah, we want to get it done and the customer is definitely going to be happy. There's no doubt. We went to a lot of effort to make sure that we beef this up for future use. Um, and, and it's worth mentioning that this never ran. Like from the day they took delivery of it, even when it was a gas engine, it didn't run. So they were like, let's get this thing running. And I think they took a stab at, you know, they gave it to a mechanic and tried to get it running. The mechanic just gave up. I don't know if it's because it's Italian or what, but the mechanic gave up. And so they said, well, let's try a different route. And that's when they reached out to me and said, hey, let's just rip everything out that's uh, gas powered and make it electric. And I'm, you know, I'm like, cool, I'm your guy. <laughs> that's great. Um, somebody was asking, I think you mentioned maybe 10 miles-ish, but is that the estimated range? So I'm hoping that it'll actually do a lot more, but I wanted to keep expectations, you know, reasonable. Uh, and so that's why I only promised, you know, as much as 10 miles of range and something like 30 miles an hour max speed. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to do more on both this top end speed and the range. But until I get to the testing phase, which if you remember from my life cycle chart is the last phase, then we won't know for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, oh, it's a reasonable a, guess. Sorry, there's a, there's a Please, recommendation. Uh, to use a small solar panel to keep the 12 volt battery topped up if, if need be. Nice. I, I wonder if the customer would permit that. I know they want it to look somewhat similar to the original form. Um, that would be really neat though, and not a bad idea. So let me suggest it to the customer and see if they're open to that idea of putting a solar panel on the top. And that would definitely save the traction pack from getting drained. I like okay. it. Great. And I'm asking Lawrence to unmute. He has a, a, a bit more to throw into the conversation related to the. Sure. Hey, Lawrence. Picture to you now. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm familiar with the Chevy Bolt and there the, unfortunately, the 12 volt does not trickle charge off the uh, uh, traction battery. So when you turn the thing off for weeks or months, um, you might end up with a dead 12 volt battery, which you have to jump 
in order to get any mm -hmm. power out of the traction battery because the, the contactor runs off the 12 volts. So I guess their theory is oh, they don't no. they've got what a, a 300 volt battery, 350 volt battery, and they want to be able to turn off all the power coming off of that. Um, so mm -hmm. when the car is off, the 350 volts isn't available outside the battery case. Oh, that's unfortunate. So then you find, and I don't know if you've experienced that where you've left your bolt sitting for quite a while at an airport or otherwise. Is it a common problem or not, not really? Well, I, uh, a friend and neighbor down the street uh, has got a bolt and one day their 12 volt battery was dead, you know, just a month or two after they got it from the dealer and uh, they jump started and everything's worked fine since, but we're all scratching our heads because they didn't leave any lights on or anything. It's like, why would their battery suddenly go dead? And personally, I think they should get that checked out because it's just waiting to happen again, maybe when they're far mm -hmm. away from home. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, otherwise, I haven't heard about it. Um, some people complain that the 12 volt batteries sometimes aren't in very good shape off the dealer's lot because they've been sitting for so long. Um, and that they sometimes do have to be replaced within the first couple of years of ownership. But I don't have any personal experience with that. Do you know in the Bolt if they're using a lead acid battery or if they're using a lithium ion battery, for example? The for 12 the 12-volt? Not is the traction. A, is a lead acid, just kind of a standard small car battery. Mm -hmm. Got it. And the reason I'm asking is, and you folks may already know this, that the lead acid battery has a very small range in which it can charge and discharge, where the lithium ion has a much deeper cycle where it can charge and discharge. And what I'm finding from the other side of my business, the Tesla repair, is that a lot of folks like to switch over their 12 volt from the factory Tesla battery, Tesla 12 volt to an upgraded lithium ion battery, which has a deeper cycle and lasts a lot longer um, and helps kind of protect that from happening. Um, so that's why I was curious if folks in the bolt had the same uh, situation where they pr would prefer to switch it over from lead acid to lithium ion. Yeah, I have no idea, but wouldn't that also require your DC to DC converter then have a BMS involved as well? So that's, no, that's a great point. So the, yeah, the question is because in a, in a normal automobile, let's say like any automobile, electric or gas powered, it, like you mentioned, there's a certain range at which it will charge and discharge. So with the Bolt, like that's something I'd have to look at and I haven't looked at, so I can't say yes or no to your question but i think it's a good point to say hey if it's in a regular if it, if the bms or should i say the let's just say the regulator the battery regulator is set for a certain range you know how will that impact the lithium ion i my my gut instinct is there's probably there's probably smarter people in the car but my instinct is that it wouldn't negatively impact the lithium ion battery and that bms wouldn't be required for that one single 12 volt in my mind, the BMS is really critical when we've got multiple cells in a pack versus a single 12 volt. Um, but again, there's probably smarter people on this call who could say. Yeah, well, each cell is around four volts. So you need to have at least three cells in series to get your 12 volts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, that's, so the, the battery, the 12 volt, you're saying the 12 volt lead acid or you're saying the replacement? No, for lithium ion, uh, typically the cells are around four volts. So if you want to replicate mm -hmm. a 12 volt battery, you'd have three in series or yeah, around three or yeah, it's like three nine, I think is a typical lithium ion cell voltage. So you'd probably have three of those so, or four of those in series to replicate a, uh, a 12 volt lead acid battery. Um, I'm familiar with a out of the box single 12 volt lithium ion battery that exists. It's not part of a pack. So, and that's through, is it called OHM, OHM, I believe? So it probably has a BMS built in that you don't so see. It might, yeah. But yeah, out of like, it looks like a regular battery. All you see is, you know, a case and two posts and that's all you see. So um, if it does, I, I'll need to look again. I believe it's OHM, OHM uh, is the one that makes it. And so, yeah, let me look to see if like, they'll give some more details on what's under the covers. And what's the range of voltages it puts out? Like how low will it go before it says, okay, too low and shuts off? And you're asking about in my application or in the 12 volt hypothetical the, that we're talking about here? The, the lithium ion 12 volt battery itself is probably mm -hmm. rated 
you know, there's a, a low voltage disconnect to preserve the lithium ion battery. Like a, a lead acid battery, you generally charge up to 15 or 16 volts to charge with a voltage mm -hmm. that it won't hold that voltage. And below, I don't know, 11 volts, you want to disconnect it or else you're going to deep cycle it and toast it or even 11 right. and a half. So I'm going to, I'm going to speak only to my application because I don't know about the, uh, this hypothetical we're speaking of. So my, my lithium ion phosphate batteries are nominal 3.2 volts. And I've got the high voltage condition set, just make sure I'm reading this right, set at 3.6 and a low voltage condition set at 2.8 to disconnect. So I don't know if you could scale for your application, you're saying 3.8, 4 volts, but I was just giving you an idea for, for mine at 3.2, what the range is for charging and discharging. And, and to be fair, I want to mention on my 48 volt pack, just to keep things completely like balanced. I actually did 16 cells where 15 would have been closer to 48. So the 16 cells together is, what is it, 51.3? Yeah, so it says 51.3 volts, which is close enough for my application to say, hey, you know, I'm powering this motor and it's gonna have a little extra, extra range or extra boost actually to it, so it's not gonna impact. So sorry, I couldn't answer your question about the, uh, now I wanna Google it while we're here. What's the name of that battery? But yeah, go ahead if there's any other questions. Anna has one. Hey, Kevin, um, have you given any thoughts to doing uh, battery swaps for Nissan Leafs? I mean, that seems to be a, a popular thing that people want to do, but there's only one Nissan dealer in town and they are kind of hard to deal with. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. So I was going to say that there's already, and may, I hope they didn't go out of business, but there's already a Nissan Leaf specific repair shop that focuses on repairing. And they're, they're on 183 and, gosh, where does it come together? Like where Mopac and 183 come together, I believe. Um, so, and if, again, I'm trying to present, so I don't have that, their name handy, but I remember seeing them and going, because it was the uh, pandemic, I went down to talk to them, but there was no one there that day so i just kind of gave up and went back but i definitely since you reminded me you need to go back and just touch base and say you know how's business and do you want to join forces or kind of what's the deal there but yeah it's it's certainly a consideration i'm i'm an equal opportunity or agnostic when it comes to evs i'm happy to work on any ev that comes our way um and so yeah so repairing replacing um swapping modules in a nissan yeah, same. Only, you know, we, we of course have to have a car lift because the those batteries they, they come out the bottom. I guess the same is true with the Tesla. So, you know, we've got to have access from under. And uh if I had my choice, I like to focus on things I can access without the lift, uh, because of the uh the additional complication there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I I, I ask around to see if we can find that that design outfit that you mentioned. That that'd be useful to know. Thanks. You're welcome. Great questions. All right, we're coming up to five minutes before the hour, so I want to go ahead and suggest we we close up shop here. Um, I want to thank you very much for offering to present and uh, spending your time sharing uh, this adventure that you've been on. And um, I want to uh, remind everybody that this is uh, one session in a series of sessions that we're doing for National Drive Electric Week. And you can find that agenda on our webpage at austinev.org. Um, and there you'll also find an opportunity perhaps to uh, join the National Electric Auto Association. Um, we are their local chapter and um, it's a fairly small fee and they really appreciate the support. So. Thank you so much, everyone.